Father, every heart of every person that's in this room this morning, uh, if we're not confronting it now, we will be confronting a decision of whether or not uh, to follow your will for our lives, whether or not to, um, to walk the path of wisdom. Because you're a God who has laid it out in front of us. You're a God who makes our path straight. You're a God who has spoken. And so, Father, I pray this morning that in every heart of every person that's here, your word and your spirit would do battle this morning. Uh, that you would oppose uh, those thoughts, uh, those enemies that would speak into our lives and tell us that you are not good, that you are not trustworthy, uh, that you don't have a plan for our lives. And so, Father, I pray this morning uh, that you would be powerful in what you do through your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you be seated, please? Let me dismiss the kids up through grade three. I'm sorry, grade five. Kids through grade five, excuse me. Kids through grade five. And you, the rest of you. If you would open up a Bible, or your Bible, or a Bible, to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. The third proverb. All but the very few of the Bibles there. If you find your way to page 528, uh, you'll be in the right spot, page 528. But Proverbs 3 is more or less in the middle of the Bible. Proverbs chapter 3. We started last week talking about wisdom. And we're going to be continuing that. This, this morning is uh, something of uh, part 2 to last week. Last week we talked about what wisdom was. This week we're going to be talking about why you should care. Why it's worth the work. To, to, to put, put into your lives wise habits. Our lives can be like uh, so much uh, of, um, of people's grass, people's lawns, right? Where you see well-worn paths through the grass. You see uh, where people have taken shortcuts from point A to point B that did not include the sidewalk. And they do it regularly. That's what habits are like in our life. Where we take these shortcuts, we get off of God's plan in our life many times. We take these shortcuts and they become well-worn paths that we take over and over and over again. And what we're trying to do in this series over the next eight weeks, we're trying to do battle against those old habits. We're trying to instill in our lives godly, wise habits uh, that would lead us more into what he has for us. So Christian, when you were an unbeliever, it was in your nature to go opposite of God's will for your life. That was normal for you. It was normal for you when you were faced with doing one thing or another, even when you chose to do something that was good, you still did it in a way that was in opposition to what God would have you do in your life. But now as a Christian, if you're honest with yourself, you still battle with those old sin, uh, that old sin in your life. Every single one of us do. Why is that? Well, it could be a problem with faith, it could be a problem with obedience, but if we looked at it in a bigger picture many times, what we're dealing with here is really nothing more than overcoming old sinful habits in our flesh. Because if you're a Christian, you have a new spirit inside of you, you are a new creation, it is no longer your default to choose to sin. So what we're doing this morning, if you're here and you have a relationship with Christ, what we're doing is I'm encouraging you to overcome those old sin habits that have become well-worn paths in your life. And this morning, if you're here and, and you're not a believer, you don't have a relationship with Christ. I said last week that ultimately, and I hope you were here, I said ultimately wisdom is this. Wisdom is orienting your heart and life towards God. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God, I, I want to say to you that, yes, you can do wise things. You can live in many ways in a wise way. But what I want you to hear this morning, if that's you, what I want you to hear is that while you may instill wise habits in your life, you still will not come to know wisdom because wisdom points me to a person. Wisdom points me to God. Wisdom points me to Jesus Christ. That is always the end goal of wisdom. It's why uh, Proverbs is going to refer to her, uh, to wisdom, as a woman who is calling out in the street corners. She's crying out for anyone that would listen. <coughs> to point you, all of that crying out is to point you to the one that wisdom comes from. 
If wisdom was easy, though, everybody would be doing it, right? But they're not. So why are wise habits worth pursuing? That's what I want us to see this morning. Why are wise habits worth pursuing? So I hope you have God's word in front of you. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3. And I want to start just by reading verses 1 through 10 this morning. Proverbs 3, 1 through 10. He says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and, gr and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. The difficulty of walking in wisdom is obvious. I said, if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. It's hard. But I want to say this first and foremost, and we're going to see it again. But I want to say this first and foremost. I want you to note how God frames this. I want you to see, Christian, that he frames this within the basis of a relationship. And that's so important. I don't want you to hear from this series in any way, shape, or form that whether or not and how well you walk in wisdom is the basis of your relationship with God. I want you to know that he cries out to you to walk in wisdom because he relates to you as a son. Do you see that in the beginning? He says, my son, right? I want you to see that, that it's on the basis of that relationship and because he loves you in that relationship that he calls you to walk in wisdom. So every time we choose to not walk according to God's will for our life, we are choosing to walk outside of the blessings of that relationship. Every time we choose to go our own way, what we're saying is that we would rather exist as though we are outside of that relationship. And so the basis of that is the basis of a father to a son. And what's he going to say? I want you to look. He, he's going to lay out in front of him a number of things that he's going to tell him to do. And we're going to come back in a second. He's going to say, here, you must do this. And when you do this, here's what God does. Okay? But I want us to see first the things that he calls us to do. More or less, it follows along, the odd verses tell us what it is God calls us to do. How he calls us to walk in wisdom. And then the even verses are going to tell us what the blessing is that comes along with it. Those are going to be part of, part of our answer to the question, why should we bother? Why should we even bother caring what God would tell us about what's a wise life and what's not? So I, I want you to look at verse 1 again. I want you to see that what he's saying to you in verse 1. He's saying to you two things. He's saying, number one, don't forget what I've taught you. Don't forget my teaching. And number two, he says, keep my commandments. And, and the important thing here is, so don't forget and keep them, but keep them not just in action, yes, that too, but also in heart. Don't forget. Hold on to them. Do them, but also do them in your heart. Okay, that's the first thing that he tells us to do. We're going to come back. Verse 3, he's going to say to us, don't lose track of the love and faithfulness of God. Don't lose track of it. There's going to be many times when you're going to question that. Hold on to the fact that God is loving and God is faithful. That's what he's saying in verse 3. And then he's going to tell us as part of that, how do we do that? We meditate on the word of God. We hide God's word in our heart. We keep it there so that when we're tempted to believe wrong things about God, to believe wrong things about his relationship to us, we would be able to, to bring back up the word of God in our life, that we would meditate on it in such a way in our lives. And then verse 5, he tells us, maybe if you know any verses from Proverbs, you know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What is he telling us? He says that we are to trust in the Lord completely without falling back on our old plans. That 
when difficulty comes, we're going to trust that God and his will and his purpose for us is going to lead us through it. And we're not going to freak out and say, ah, I've got to get back onto my old plan. I've got to take the reins back. I've got to take the wheel. I've been driving since I was seven years old. Partly because it was rural Louisiana and we could get away with it. But I had an older gentleman up the street from me and I would walk up to his house because it was a different day and age. As a four and five year old, I would walk a half mile to this man's house. And he would spend time with me because he was in his 70s and, and he was happy to spend time with me, so I tell myself. But one of the things he would do is he would pull out his Dodge pickup, this blue Dodge pickup. Uh, and, and he would climb into the driver's seat and he would take me and he would sit me on his lap. And he would allow me to steer as we drove down the road. Now, at the time, I thought I was really steering things, right? Of course, of course, he's got his foot on the brake pedal. I was too short to reach it. He's got his hand on the wheel, even as he allows me to turn the wheel. And, and I say all of that to say this. As we learn to apply God's habits into our life, yes, they're hard, but God is going to go with us as we do that in our life. God is going to be working with us as we apply these things into our life for that purpose. So trust in the Lord completely without falling back on your own plans. Now, he's going to say also in verse 7, don't consider yourself wise, but keep your heart humble before God. Always being ready to repent. Keeping your heart humble, keeping your heart where it should be before God, always ready to repent. And in verse 9, what verse 9 is really talking about is the fact that when God gives you, and this is, this is sneaky important for what we're going to be talking about this morning, okay? When God gives you good things, remember that the purpose of those good things is to honor and glorify God. That's so important here because we're talking about blessings, and he wants you to know that even as he gives you good things, that those good things are not the point. Those good things are all supposed to be rolled back into something that would cause your heart not to trust in those things or even ultimately to delight in those things, but that you might glorify God and delight in him as the one who gave them in the first place. That all of those things would be there for the glory of God. Now, the easiest of these, if we look at these as habits, the easiest of them are not that easy. Because if, if, if I was to say, what's the easiest thing on this list for me to do? It's probably to say that we would spend time meditating on God's word. Not just quickly reading it and one off and, and going on, but meditating on God's word. But I'm not going to ask the question because I know the answer. How many of us struggle to really have that be a consistent habit in our life? That's the easiest thing on the list. That's a lot easier than controlling my heart, controlling my delight, all of those things. And yet we struggle to do those things. Certainly these are more than just habits. Faith is involved. Obedience is involved. But they are not less than habits. That is an important part of what we're doing here. Each one is a discipline. Each one is a decision that we are going to orient our heart and our steps towards God. Every single one. That we get up. So, what does that look like in our life? Well, maybe what it means is that you're going to decide that you're not going to sleep those extra 20 minutes. Or stay up quite as late watching that next episode of The Mandalorian. Or whatever it is that you're currently binging on, on your free trial of Disney+. Plus, Right? Maybe it means that you're going to orient your time in such a way that you carve out that time in your life. Maybe it means that you're going to discipline your heart that when trouble comes, you're not going to fall back into that pattern of complaining. But instead, you're going to remember God's love and past faithfulness to you to carry you through those things. Maybe what it means is that when difficulty comes, you're going to resist the urge to go back onto your old plan. And you're going to stay right there, trusting that God, who led you into this, is going to lead you out of it. Maybe what it means is that you're going to choose to live on less. So that as God blesses you with more, you can use what God has blessed you with for his glory, for the advancement of the gospel, for the reaching of the nations. 
Maybe that's a decision, a discipline that you need to roll into your life. But I want you to understand, I want to remind you again, that God does not relate to you as a drill sergeant. God is not a drill sergeant. God is not up there just waiting for you to step out of line so he can correct you. Instead, God relates to you as a father. And in Proverbs 3 is a beautiful picture where he's inviting you in. He's saying to you, here's my will. Here's my wisdom for your life. If you walk in it, here's what I'm going to do in your life. And I want you to see this now. So we've seen what we're called to do. I want you to see how what God is inviting you into. So, so here's, here's the first thing in your program that I hope that you'll take a moment and write down. Here are the blessing principles. And I'm going to tell you why I'm calling them that in a minute. But the blessing principles for a life wisely lived. Here are the principles that he says of how he's going to bless you if you will live a life, your life, wisely. If you will seek to follow him. The, the first thing he's going to say in verse 2, if you look at verse 2, he says, For length of days and years of, li and, and years of life and peace they will add to you. What's he saying? He's saying, here's what I'm going to do in your life if you'll, if you'll put these wise habits into place. Here's what I'll do. I'll give you many days filled with peace. I'll give you many days filled with peace. The second thing that he says, verse 4, he says, so you will find favor. And that's the same word that's translated grace. We're talking here about God's favor. You'll find grace, you'll find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. What's he saying? He's saying this is the blessing that's going to be poured out in your life, that you're going to get grace from heaven and have a good name on earth. If you choose to live wisely, the principle for your life is that others are going to think well of you and that God is going to be gracious to you. The third thing that he's going to say is in verse 6, he says, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Here's what he's talking about, number three. He says, if you'll walk in my wisdom, I will give you a life directed by divine purpose. I'm going to give you a life that I'm directing. I'm going to make your path straight in front of you. I'm going to make my will clear to you. I'm going to let you see my hand at work. You're going to know that I, your loving Heavenly Father, are guiding and carrying you through it. The fourth thing that he's going to say, we find in verse 8. He says, it will be healing for your flesh and, reflesh and refreshment for your bones. What's he talking about here? I'm a Baptist, but I'm not going to shy away from this. He's talking about physical healing and spiritual and emotional refreshment. This is what God is going to do in your life. Number five, verse 10, he says, If you will honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be burst, bursting with wine. What's he talking about? He's talking about as a principle of blessing in your life that you're going to be satisfied and you're going to be free from want. You're going to be satisfied and you are going to be free from want. Now, if I were to ask you, what, in your experience, your heart, the human heart, is longing for. If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Christ, if you'd be honest with yourself and you'd ask yourself, what is your heart longing for? Is it not peace? Would you not say this morning that what I want more than anything else is peace? Is it not grace? That when you look at your life and the regrets that you have over decisions you've made and the results of those decisions, that you wish that you could find grace and restoration? Is it not to have a good name, to be well thought of? Is it not to have a life with purpose? Still, one of the best-selling books ever outside of the Bible is Rick Warren's book from the early 90s, The Purpose Driven Life. Why? Because it hit a nerve in the human heart of a desire for a life that had purpose. A purpose in your life. Is it not that you might find refreshment for your soul? Again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you would long for that right now? Just emotional and spiritual refreshment, right? I got one anyway, right? 
That's the desire of the human heart. And here's what God is saying. God is saying to you, if you will instill wisdom into your life, into your habits, these are the principles of what I'm going to do in your life. And you don't have to be you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to even look to the scriptures to see that these things are the desire of the heart. Eastern religions and the different ancillary things that come with it, like yoga and meditation and all of those things, those things are exploding in America today as a reaction to all of the consumerism and materialism and all of those things and people coming to the end of it and realizing that, that all of those things are not bringing peace into their life. And so you've got a growing number of people that are trying to find it in these Eastern religions. The problem is that what they're doing is they're doubling down on the problem. Because materialism and consumerism and all those things said, look to the satisfaction of yourself. Look to yourself to find the satisfaction of these things. And, and these Eastern religions, the, all the things that go along with them, they're still saying, look inside yourself. And wisdom is calling out from the book of Proverbs saying, no, no, look to God. Look to God. That's where you're going to find the satisfaction, the peace, the security that you're looking for. Those are the blessing principles that I'm going to pour out in your life, God is saying, if you'll apply wisdom to your life. Now, some of you, as I was reading those things, you're looking at me kind of askance, and you're going, <coughs> I didn't think we were that kind of church, right? You, you do what God wants you to do, and God's going to make you rich. And God's going to give you everything you ever desired and all of that. That's a thing called the prosperity gospel that's huge in the church today. You can find it all over the place. Come and follow after Jesus because Jesus will give you the desires of your selfish heart. It's everywhere today. Is that what Solomon is saying in these verses? Some kind of cold-hearted materialism dressed up in religion. Is it nothing more than what God wants for you is to give you those selfish desires that you have? See, the problem with that is the verses we're about to see, but it's also that it has no room for what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, it's going to be up on the screen for you. It, he says in verse 7, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. What's he saying? All of these things. He says in another place, he says, whether in plenty or in want, I've learned to be content. Whether I have a lot or I have nothing, I've learned to be content. Why? Because he's contented on Christ. He knows that that's the real prize. That's the real thing that he's longing for. So, is what Solomon had in mind the prosperity gospel, or is it what Paul had in mind in Philippians chapter 3? Look at verses 11 and 12. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And I would say to you, if what Solomon has in mind is the prosperity gospel, is... You follow after God, and you will always get these blessings in your life exactly to the extent that you want. Then verses 11 and 12 would not be here. They would not be here. Look at verse 11. He says, my son, again, he's going back to your relationship as the basis for what God wants to do in your life. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Does that not assume that there are going to be times... There are going to be times in your life when there are going to be things that you long for, things that you think you need, things that you want, that God is not going to give to you. That there are going to be desires that come up in our life that he's not going to give it in the time or to the amount that we want. Otherwise, what is discipline? Verse 12. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father, the son in whom he delights. So what he's saying is, and this one I just left in there because I was afraid you wouldn't write it otherwise. Okay? As we apply these wise habits to our life, we have to leave room in our willingness to follow them for the corrective discipline of God in our life. 
Because here's what might happen if we don't. If God just simply gave us everything, God knows our hearts. God knows our hearts. And if he gives and gives and gives everything we think we need, we will begin to trust in those things. We'll begin to think that those things are the point. So there's going to be times in your life where he's going to pull back some of those things. Because what he's saying in pulling back health, pulling back wealth, pulling back some of those things in your life is what he's saying is, are you delighting in me or are you delighting in these things? And maybe it's to expose something that's going on in our heart that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Maybe it's to show us something that, that we never knew was there. Maybe it's because God's wanting to work into a new direction in our lives. And so we have to stop and we have to leave room and we have to say, Okay, God, what are you showing me through this thing that I feel is lacking in my life? What is the point? But what we can't do is say that we are going to despise the Lord's discipline. We're going to hate it. God, I don't trust you anymore. I despise your discipline. I'm tired of your correction because the difficult correction, what God is doing is tearing down the walls of sin and the longing for things other than God in our lives. The things that are standing in the way of us fully experiencing the love and relationship that he created you to enjoy. See, I said to you before that these are the principles of how God blesses us in this life, and they are true. I am not pulling back from those as principles for your life. I have lived long enough, not as long as some of you, but long enough that I'm earning my gray hairs. I have lived long enough. Last year was 25 years since my high school graduation. I, I know, right? I don't look that old. I don't look that old, but 25 years since my high school graduation. By the time I get just a little bit further, uh, if, if we have a 30-year high school reunion, I wonder when I look at their faces what I'm going to see. There's an old saying, I said it to a couple of you this week because I, I probably think about it more than I should, but, but somebody said, I don't remember who I give them credit or blame if you don't like it, they said that by the time you're 50, you have the face that you've earned. And, and what they mean is, whether you have laugh lines or frown lines or whatever you have, you've earned that face, and it says something, right? It says something. I wonder when I look at their face and they look at mine what kind of face they're going to see. I wonder what they're going to see. What kind of a face are they going to see in us? We've got to leave room in our life for that, di that difficult uh, correction that God might bring into it. Because he's going to say in verse 14, this is outside the scope really of what we're talking about, but he's going to say in verse 14, you can look at it and you can fact check me, okay? He's going to say that what you'll find as a result of that correction from God is better than gold and silver. Take that, prosperity gospel preachers. It's better than gold and silver. It is more precious than jewels, and there's nothing you could desire that's better than that. So is God not giving you what you need when you find yourself in that discipline? No, he's giving you exactly what you need. He's giving you exactly what you need. We have to leave room for the corrective work of God. Sometimes he brings this difficulty in our life because the point was never the blessings in the first place. We're going to see this in just a second, okay? I know some of you that what you're hoping for is all of those things, those seven or eight things I told you at the beginning that God is going to do as blessings in your life, those principles of blessings <coughs> in your life. But God is only bringing those things into your life for a very different purpose, to point you instead to a blessing that he never removes, that he never takes away. I, I, I want you to see it. I want you to look at verse 5 again. Verse 5, he's going to start off this way. Trust in the Lord. Verse 7, he's going to say at the beginning of the second part of the verse, fear the Lord. Verse 9, he says, Honor the Lord. What's he doing? He's reminding you that in all of these blessings, the point is not the blessing. The point is to point you to God. 
The point is that you would learn that, remember, we saw this last week, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, reminding ourselves that we are submitted underneath him. But, but going beyond that, that we would learn through his blessings, his faithfulness to us, that we can trust in the Lord. That we can truly trust in him. That, that as we receive those things, that the point of them is not so that we might be honored. The point of them is so that he might be honored. As he gives us, as he blesses us, as he fills our lives with peace. That he might be honored through those things. That is the blessing. So, here's the, here's the main idea. I got to listen to my nephew uh, preach a sermon this week. It was the delight of my week. Um, and uh, he, he did this at the end, and it made me feel so good, so good that he would do this. Here's the main idea, okay? Here it is. I want you to see this. Wise habits are worth pursuing. I'm, I'm giving the answer to the question that I posed at the beginning. Why is it worth the hard work? It's worth pursuing because they teach me to trust and honor the Lord. They teach me to trust and honor the Lord. My dad's dad, my, my grandfather, he owned a kennel of beagles. Uh, he would raise beagles and sell them off and all of those kinds of things. And so every time I was, I was um, the, the beagles never bit, my grandfather did. He was one of those kinds of grandfathers, you know what I mean? He, he, was, he likes me now, he didn't like me so much when I was little, and I can't really blame him. But so I spent a lot of time with those puppies, you know, and they would... If you've ever been around a kennel of beagles, you, you know, they're loud dogs, and, and it's constant. But I would spend a lot of time feeding them. And, and you could always tell how a dog had been treated, either by a human or by the rest of the pack, herd? I, I don't know what it is of beagles. But, but anyway, there they are. You could always tell how one had been treated because you would hold that whatever, that treat out in your hand. Usually for me, I would steal hot dogs from my grandfather's refrigerator, and I'd cut them up, and I'd feed them to the dogs, you know. And... and uh, which sounds bad, feeding a dog hot dogs, but anyway. <laughs> I'd feed them to him, and you could see the dog based on how they responded to you, how that dog had been treated. Because if that dog was quick to trust, you knew that dog had been treated well. If that dog had been injured by a human or been treated ill by a human, they would tend to lurk away, and you'd have to work to build that trust. Well, here's the thing. For every single person in this room, but especially if you're still in your sin, what you need to understand is that sin has abused you. Sin has beaten you down, partly living in a world of sin, partly by your own choice, allowing yourself to be beaten down by it. It has abused you, and it can be hard to learn to trust in God. And that's why as we apply these wise habits to our life, God shows us again and again that he's trustworthy. He shows us that he is good. He shows us that he's enough. Wise habits, they show us that he's faithful to his word, that he's faithful to his people, that he provides for us peace and joy. Learning to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and acknowledging him in all things reminds us that he is present and loving towards us in all things. He blesses us with these things. So Christian, my, my question for you this morning is, why would you not seek to follow after God in wisdom? Why would you say with your mouth, and maybe even put your eternity in the hands of Christ, genuinely trusting in Christ for your eternity, but you won't trust him for today. And you won't trust him for tomorrow. And you'll choose instead your own path and your own plan. Now we're all doing battle. We're all doing battle every single day against those old sinful habits. And every single time we've got to slow down and we've got to remind ourselves, no, wisdom is calling out to me. And I have a choice right now to make of whether or not I'm going to choose to follow after the one that I call my Lord and Savior, if I'm going to choose to follow after him and trust his will for me, that he will carry me through, that he will satisfy me, that he will give me peace, that he'll save me from anxiety, all of those things that plague us, 
Will we trust him or not? Why would you trust him with your eternity and not with today? And if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ, what I would say to you is trust in the Lord. Submit yourself to him. Honor him as God. If you want, if you're here this morning and all you've said to yourself, all that I care about is finding wisdom for today and tomorrow, I want to say to you this morning that you will not be able to live a life of peace in the world until you find a life of peace in your heart. And that's what we want for you this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for the promises that we find there. I thank you that while you are a God who cares so deeply about our needs today, you don't stop there. And so, Father, I thank you that we can truly pray that you would give us today's bread, that you would give us today what we need, and we can trust that you are a God who answers that prayer. So much more, we can, we can know that the work that you're doing is so much deeper, so much more important of doing your will in our life, of your peace in our heart, of your goodness in our steps. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us to just decide that we want to discipline our lives, to choose each day that we're going to walk in wisdom, that we're going to walk according to your will. So, Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.